Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. You know, at FaithBridge, we love to put tools in people's hands to help them with the various challenges that life brings. And I want to tell you about two of them this morning related to marriage. First of all, you should have in your bulletin a, a small card referencing an upcoming workshop. Next Saturday, the workshop will be put on by the same Ron and Sherry that you just saw in the video. God has given to Ron and Sherry Torbert a unique and special gift for uh, healing, for bringing hope, uh, for bringing encouragement to marriages that are in uh, most any situation, those that uh, are desperate, those that maybe just need a tune-up. So I would encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity. It's going to be a great day, and uh, you will enjoy the, the blessing of being with Ron and Sherry. Also, I want to tell you about a resource that Pastor Ken first told you about last week. It's a book entitled A Lifelong Love by Gary Thomas. And I agree with Pastor Ken of all the many books that I have read about marriage, this is the best. Uh, Gary has a marvelous way of communicating powerful truths in very accessible sort of ways. We sold out last week, so we ordered a new batch. Want to encourage you to go on out and pick yourself up a copy. If, if we run out, we'll order some more. Again, that's how much we believe in this book and this resource. The publisher has given us an early release deal, only $12. It will be considerably more expensive when it hits the bookstores. So please, uh, before you leave today, take advantage of this opportunity for this resource. Today is the second installment in a three-part series that we're doing on marriage. Before we jump in, let's take a minute and pray together. Father, we're grateful for a new day and the opportunity that we have to come and to worship you, to lift up the name of your son, Jesus Christ, to experience the power and the fullness of your Holy Spirit. We ask now that as we turn our hearts toward your word, you would provide for us the ability not only to learn and receive helpful information, but to put it into practice and to give your word room and space to become active in our lives. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, on September the 8th, 1949, this happy young couple stood before Pastor Underwood at the Mount Hope Baptist Church just outside of Franklin, North Carolina and said, I will, and I do, and made vows to love, honor, and cherish each other in sickness and in health, for richer, for poor, for better, for worse, till death should part them. And I, for one, am particularly grateful that they did choose to do that, because from that union, yours truly came into this world in 1962. And uh, two weeks ago, or not, not quite two weeks ago, that same happy young couple celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary. And yeah, I'll, I'll clap for them. I, that's remarkable, I think. 65 years. I, I marvel at their achievement, not only just for the sheer number of years, but the fact that their marriage is better than ever. And it's always been a pretty good one. They genuinely love and like each other and enjoy being with each other. And I pray that God blesses them with many more years yet to come. When I share with people that my folks have been married for 65 years, invariably I get two responses. One is a, a happy amazement at their remarkable achievement. The second though is a question. How did they do it? How does a couple make it that long? Year after year after year. How do you hang in there? You know, in this day of soaring divorce rates, of widespread marital discord, that's a good question to ask. 
how does a couple make it year after year? Perhaps some of you are thinking, gee, Pastor Dan, I'd like to know how to make it to next week, much less year after year. Well, the Bible is not silent on this question. If you will turn in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, Paul has some words to say about what is involved in making a marriage that lasts. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers will be glad to give you one. While you are turning to Ephesians chapter 5, uh, let me remind you of a, a tool, a service that we offer called Postscript. Postscript is a chance for you to send in your questions about the sermon. And then uh, a little later today, I will participate in a video where I address those questions and we can go a little bit deeper into the topic than the half hour or so that we're permitted during the sermon. So if, if uh, something intrigues you or a question comes to mind, feel free to send it right on and we'll address that in the postscript. We are in the book of Ephesians, written by the Apostle Paul, chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. This is a rich passage of Scripture, practically any single verse in the passage could yield a sermon all on its own. But for our purposes this morning, I want us to step back and look at the passage as a whole. I want us to uh, take the, uh, the 30,000 foot view, if you will. And from that vantage point, we see that Paul is addressing two things. First of all, he is giving to both wives and husbands specific responsibilities, things that he wants each of them to actually do. And from those responsibilities, from those behaviors that Paul is encouraging here, uh, secondly, we see a movement in marriage toward a particular goal, and that goal is becoming one flesh. Now, this is a topic that, that uh, Paul is going to come back to again a little bit later in uh, the passage, but he begins the message, uh, begins this particular passage by talking about how marriage, first and foremost, is a spiritual exercise. Marriage is a spiritual exercise. Now, I want to take a few minutes and elaborate on that. Because uh, not many people have this perspective or this understanding of the institution of marriage. For most people, marriage is primarily about love and romance or uh, focusing on the other person or building a life together or maybe trying to uh, have a family, these sorts of things. But for Paul... Marriage is primarily a means through which we grow in our relationship with God. God has any number of ways through which He can call us to Himself. He can use practically any circumstance in our lives to draw us to Himself, to make us more like His Son, Jesus Christ. But there are a few things that God has specifically created just for this purpose, and marriage is one of them. 
All of those other things that I just mentioned certainly have a role in marriage and they play a part in marriage, but they are not the primary focus from God's perspective. From God's perspective, marriage is designed to be a tool. It is a means to an end whereby each one of us who are married grow in our knowledge of God and we become more and more like his son, Jesus Christ. Now, it's important to get a handle on this perspective of marriage because it can really reshape the way you come at it, the way you look at your spouse, the way you look at yourself, the way you choose to relate to one another. No single spouse, no human being can bear the weight of responsibility that marriage brings with it. When we marry someone, we are asking things of them that they are incapable of delivering, making us happy, fulfilling us, bringing us to a place of uh, reward and honest enjoyment in the entirety of the relationship, but none of us can fully deliver on that. We may have our moments where we shine, but by and large, because we are sinful and broken creatures, that is going to be an impossible delivery for any of us to make. And that is why God says, look, it's not primarily about you. It's not primarily about your spouse. It is primarily about me. Paul begins by saying, submit to one another. Why? Out of reverence for Christ, because you know and love Jesus and because you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus. That's why you give your all to this thing called marriage. Now, there's nothing about marriage in and of itself that is going to automatically make us more like Jesus or automatically make us know more about God. In fact, sometimes marriage in and of itself can do just the opposite. That's why Paul is careful after that opening sentence to then begin to assign responsibilities to both husbands and wives. You see, there are things that we have to do in order for marriage to achieve all that God wants it to achieve. It doesn't just happen all by itself. There is work to be done. Every marriage that achieves the goals for which God intended, that man and wife become one flesh and that man and wife grow in their relationship with God, achieve all of that by work, by taking the initiative, by deciding, yes, I'm going to do what God is asking me to do. Husbands, Love your wives. Why? Because Christ loved the church. He's circling it right back around to Jesus. Wives, submit to your husbands. Why? Out of a love for Jesus. Paul is constantly weaving Jesus in and out of this entire passage. And as each spouse, husband and wife, fulfill their respective responsibilities, they begin quite naturally according to God's plan, to move toward that ultimate goal of becoming one flesh. It won't happen on its own, and it won't happen without our effort. Sometimes people say to me, oh, Dan, that just sounds so much like works righteousness. Well, I'm not talking, friends, about earning anything here. God is always opposed to earning, but He's never opposed to effort. And God has an expectation that you and I will put forth effort to grow our marriage so that we do become one flesh. That goal is something that we arrive at. It doesn't happen just because we have a piece of paper that says we are married. We're working in our lives to achieve those responsibilities and to arrive at that place of being one flesh. Several years ago, my wife, Becky, and I had the privilege of uh, taking a tour of the beautiful nation of Greece. We went on a, a tour called the Footsteps of Paul, where we retraced all the places that he went during his ministry in that country. And most of the tour took place in a motor coach, a, a big spacious bus, so we were able to see a great deal of the countryside. Well, I began to notice after a day or two a, a recurring theme 
among the homes in Greece, that is, the, the individual private residences. That is, almost every single one of them were at some stage of construction. N- none of them were complete. Everyone was, was adding on a room or rebar coming out of the top of the house for a second level. Some uh, degree of construction Completion was going on. Curiosity finally got the best of me, and I asked our tour guide, what, what is the deal with everybody's house? Is everybody adding on to their house in Greece? Well, she smiled a crooked smile at me and said, uh, that, that is no coincidence. You see, here in Greece, as long as your home is under construction, you don't have to pay property tax. <laughs> so it was like this big national joke that everybody's house was under construction. So nobody was paying property tax. And I'm sure it seemed like a really good idea at the time. I mean, not only do you not have to uh, lay out a bunch of money to finish a project, but neither do you have to pay tax either. It just made good financial sense until, you remember what happened in Greece about two years ago? One of the worst economic meltdowns in modern history. I mean, that country just came within a whisker of going entirely bankrupt. And those who have looked at their situation concluded that one of the primary contributing factors to their financial distress was a failure to collect adequate tax revenues. The failure of the people to finish their homes nearly took the whole country down the tubes. It seems to me that uh, many, many marriages are like the homes in Greece. You know, they started out great. They were going to build a beautiful home, and it was going to be a strong home and a warm, inviting, gracious home. But at some point along the way, it just got kind of difficult or inconvenient. I mean, the, the cost was just too high to keep working on this thing, and really it just became uh, more convenient to stop. The day that we stop working on our marriage is the day that we set a trajectory for marital bankruptcy. It may not happen right away. It may not happen in a week or a month or even years, but eventually there will come a time when that marriage will crumble and die, even if the two people remain under the same roof, their marriage will be just as dead and they will be able to trace it right back to the day that the two of them said, not going to work on it anymore. The reason Paul assigned responsibilities to both husbands and wives is because he wanted us to understand. God wanted us to understand. This is something that you've got to work at, and you've got to work at it every single day if you want it to go somewhere, if you really want it to achieve what I have in mind for it to achieve. I remember early in our marriage, oh, two or three years into it, uh, Becky began to express some displeasure with my husbanding skills, we'll call it. Uh, She uh, effectively communicated to me that her needs were not being met. And I was befuddled. I could not figure out, you know, what what am I not doing? What's going on here? I'm, I'm doing everything that I know to do, but apparently it's not addressing whatever her problem is. So uh, I found someone who had been down the road a little bit further than me in marriage and reported to him, look, I, pff, I don't know what's going on with Becky. She tells me I'm not meeting her needs and I'm doing everything that I know to do. And she keeps talking about how I'm not loving her the way that she needs to be loved. And he said, well, Dan, um, have you ever asked her how she wants to be loved? And I said, well, of course, yeah, I mean... What dummy wouldn't know to do that? Making a note to myself, ask Becky how she wants to be loved. So I went straight home and I I asked her, 
How, how do you want to be loved? And guess what? She told me. She didn't waste any time letting me know. This is what you can do to make me feel loved. You know, so often we want to love our spouses the way that we like to be loved. That's not loving. That is selfish and arrogant. And my eyes were open to the truth of the matter that I, you know, I could take Becky flowers every day of the week and she would be grateful for it, but she wouldn't feel loved. I could tell her how beautiful she is and how much I love her and even write poetry to that effect and she'd be grateful for it, but she wouldn't feel loved. I could spend every waking available moment with her and I think she'd be grateful for it, but I know she wouldn't feel loved. What makes my wife feel loved is when after dinner, I help clean off the table. And then I help the girls with homework and I run errands and I do things to serve her. She feels very unloved when she feels like she's in this thing all by herself and she's having to work overtime to keep the place going. And Dan seems oblivious to it all. You know, marriage is hard work, but it is not complex work. That was a big aha moment for me. That yeah, it's, it's hard. You put forth physical energy, emotional energy, mental energy, but it doesn't require tremendous amounts of brain power. It's really a matter of wanting to know what's involved, and then being willing to do what is necessary to address the problem. Far too many of us assume that these things are going to work themselves out, that they're just going to sort of take care of themselves. That is not the way marriage works. Marriage works when a husband and a wife come together and both understand, I've got to take initiative here. I've got to do something every single day. I've got to make deposits, emotional, loving deposits into the life of this marriage so that it can grow, so that it can move towards that place of us becoming one flesh. That's what God has in mind for each and every married couple. Our activity is moving toward a goal of becoming one flesh. For this reason, Paul says, a man shall leave his home and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. What does it mean to be one flesh? Well, at a minimum, it has to do with two individual lives dying to themselves and understanding that their focus is now on each other. And they begin to work toward this intimacy and this ability, not just to be with one another, but to truly love and serve one another without much concern for themselves. It is a very other-oriented, others-focused enterprise. And if we stick with it, it will yield an intimacy, an emotional, physical, mental intimacy that is something God has reserved for those who have been willing to pay the price and those who have been willing to die to themselves and pour into each other. Unfortunately, most of us are more interested in what Gary Thomas calls an artificial intimacy. It's an intimacy that to the rest of the world looks like the real thing. It looks genuine. But in fact, if you were to examine it a little closer and look at it a little more carefully, it's just as shallow and hollow as it can be. There is nothing to it. It is all appearance and no substance they may live under the same roof, but that's about all they are doing. Really, it's more about being roommates who are getting the tasks of life done than it is about becoming one flesh. The best visual that I can think of for a life like this is parallel lines, two lives that are just moving through the years, but never ever coming to a place of truly intersecting with one another. 
And that's sad because God has so much more in mind for our lives as husbands and wives. So what does it take to become one flesh? How does a couple fulfill their responsibilities in such a way that they can arrive at that place? Well, we don't have time to talk about it exhaustively, but I think there are a minimum of three things that every couple should be doing every single day in order to get there. And the first of those is active and purposeful communication. Active and purposeful communication. Notice I didn't just say communication because even roommates have to communicate. That's just the transfer of information. No, I'm talking about a communication where there is an investment in the other person, a communication that is intentional. It doesn't just happen when it's convenient or when you get around to it, but you're thinking proactively about when and how you're going to communicate. It's a communication that is vulnerable and courageous. There's no hiding. There's no secrets. There's no withdrawal from one another, but it's presenting ourselves to one another transparently, being fearless in the presence of one another because a trust has been gained through the repetition of that vulnerable communication. And it's a communication that occurs with frequency, daily. Every single day, there is an intentionality about reaching out to the other person. And it can range from something as simple as a hug and a kiss and the affirmation that I love you and you are the most important person in the world to me, all the way to a weekend apart where you talk every minute of every day. Couples that are moving towards one flesh are communicating, not withdrawing. Secondly, a couple that's going to move to a place of becoming one flesh is a couple that knows how to forgive. Forgive. Every marriage needs it and none can survive without it. Why? Because we are all sinners married to sinners. And we are all going to hurt each other. And we are all going to blow it from time to time. And forgiveness is the only thing that God has given to us to restore broken relationships. All of us are going to need it at some point in time. And all of us are going to have to give it at some point in time. And I'm not talking about scenarios where if you're the one in need of forgiveness, your attitude is like, uh, well, sorry. Sorry that you got your feelings hurt. And if you're the one that is giving the forgiveness, your attitude is not, uh, well, it's okay. No, never mind. It's all right. Forget it. Nothing. That's not forgiveness. That's denial. That's projection. No, forgiveness is coming together face to face and honestly saying, I am sorry. I was wrong. That was thoughtless of me. I hurt your feelings and I take responsibility for that. Forgiveness is saying, yes, you did. But I choose to forgive you. I love you. The relationship is more important to me than the ability to hold something over your head. Every marriage needs it and none can survive without it. And third, a marriage that's moving towards one flesh is one in which a husband and wife have come together in Christ. You see, intimacy is not something that God thought of or created just for human beings. No, intimacy is a reflection of the very character of God. From eternity past, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have been in holy, perfect intimacy with one another. And the reason Jesus came for us to forgive us of our sins and invite us back into fellowship with him was so that one day we could join them in that celebration of intimacy, that union, that fellowship, that friendship with God himself. And marriage really is the grand rehearsal for that union. It's one of the many ways that God has given to us to prepare ourselves for himself. 
And so when you look at your spouse, not only are you looking at a human being, a broken human being to whom you have committed yourself, you are also looking at the means that God has chosen for you to get ready for eternity with him. You're knocking the corners off of each other's life to get ready for an eternity with God. That's why. We've got to hang in there. How long is it going to take? It's going to take until death do us part. There is never going to be a day when you and I can say, well, we've arrived. We got that one figured out. What's next? No, marriage is about a lifetime, a lifetime of work, a lifetime of moving towards one flesh. And perhaps best of all, the reward that one receives as they make this journey year after year after year, is not only the blessing of becoming one flesh with another human being, but also of moving towards union with Jesus Christ and becoming like Jesus Christ for all of eternity. That's why it matters. Now, there are some today here, I am keenly aware for whom marriage has not been a movement towards one flesh. It has been a rip and a tear. And the pain of divorce and separation has brought your dreams and your hopes crashing down. I am acquainted with that pain myself. But I want you to know that the cross is God's message to you, that there is no sin that he cannot forgive, and there is no failure that is bigger than his love. The cross is the very epitome of perseverance. It's God's message that he will not give up on us no matter what. Even if we have failed in marriage, God still loves us, and God is still moving and working in us to draw us to himself. And I'm sure that in a crowd this size, there's probably couples who for a variety of reasons are not on their way toward becoming one flesh. It has become hard and challenging and maybe you're ready to give up. And my word to you is don't quit. God has not quit on you. Don't quit on him. There are people in this church like Ron and Sherry Torbert and others that God has provided to come alongside you and your spouse and they will make that journey with you and they will help you move to that place of healing and wholeness and forgiveness and return to the journey to which God has called all married couples. Marriage is a grand rehearsal. It takes our whole lives, but it's getting us ready for all of eternity. Would you pray with me? Father, we confess to you that it is so easy for us to get off track, to make marriage all about us, our needs, our wants, our desires, even to make marriage all about our spouse. forgive us for losing focus and for failing to understand that this is your gift to us to remind us about you and to draw us to yourself. Give us that renewed perspective today. And I pray, Lord, for those who um, are suffering for whatever reason in the midst of their marriage, that you would show yourself to be the God who loves who cares and who heals. And we ask all this in Jesus' name, amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day.
Hi, and welcome to another Postscript. I'm Justin Teague, the Worship and Communications Pastor at FaithBridge, and I'm with Dan Slagle, our Care and Bridging Pastor, who just finished part two of our sermon of our series called Till Death Do Us Part on Marriage. Welcome, Dan. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for a great message sure. this morning. Uh, we had a couple of, of questions that came in. Um, the first one uh, had to do with verse 31 on uh, from your message talking about leaving and cleaving. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure who the author of the question was, but the uh, best guess is somebody's trying to find a loophole in a leaving and cleaving that maybe the scripture only meant the husband in that equation and not the wife. Okay. What, what is the, the answer to that? Uh, who is leaving and who is cleaving in this? Well, if, if you were to take the uh, passage strictly at face value, it would appear that only the husband is the one doing the leaving and the cleaving. But in the context, that is clearly not the case. The, the, the implication is that, that both leave and cleave. It, it goes on to say, and the two shall become one flesh. Um, th there, there is no becoming one flesh unless both parties have made the conscious choice to, to leave. My guess would be that the reason the writers of Scripture focused on the husband is because at the time of that writing, it was primarily a patriarchal society. And uh, all of the action, you know, came through the lens of a male-oriented worldview. So it would not have seemed strange to the original readers from that male-dominated society for it to have said, well, look, this is what men do. Uh, I, I don't think it, it provides any sort of out for uh, a woman to, to not leave and, and cleave. I don't, I don't think that was the intention of the author at all. Great. Uh, second question that came in. I'm just going to go ahead and read this one. Um, you know, I, I giggled when I first read it. Well, I didn't giggle. I'm a man. I chuckled. And uh, I chuckled it when I read this, but then I thought this actually, this will probably ring true with a lot of people, and maybe even me. If I haven't said it, I've probably felt it. But this is coming from the wife. She asks, uh, my husband thinks that every time I have my own opinion, meaning I disagree with him, that A, I am not respecting him, and B, I am not supporting him. Can you please address this? Well, as the old saying goes, there are two sides to every story. <clears throat> and it may be that the situation is exactly how this person is presenting it, that the husband apparently uh, has low self-esteem, low to the point that he cannot tolerate disagreement and, and interprets disagreement as disrespect. Mm. If, in fact, that is the case, then what is needed is for uh, the husband to uh, get in a place where he can begin to understand that distinction and also get in a place where he can begin to develop some healthy self-esteem to the point that a disagreement is not going to throw him off his game and he doesn't have to resort to name-calling or uh, pigeonholing his wife as a, a disrespecter. Um, on the other hand, though, uh, it could be that the wife is disagreeing in a very disrespectful way. Hmm. It, it's perfectly fine to disagree, but the manner in which you do that can make all the difference in the world. If you are in any way belittling the other person as if their opinion were ridiculous, uh, if your body language is such that you're dismissive of uh, their thoughts, their opinions, certainly if if you use uh, uh, language that is harm, name calling, th things like that, well, yeah, I, he may be right. <laughs> you may be disrespectful. Uh, so my bottom line, my suggestion would be call Beth Ellis. Let's get in here and talk about it 
uh, as a couple with someone who can guide you to the, the truth and, and get to a helpful answer. Great. Hey, uh, a lot of practical stuff today. Uh, Good. I think a lot of people will be picking up the book as well and reading up more. Uh, what's that called again? Gary Thomas's newest. Lifelong Love. Oh, lifelong Love. So fantastic. Well, thank you, Dan, You're for uh, preaching today and for Postscript. And thank you for joining us for another Postscript. We will see you back next week with Pastor Ken as he concludes this th series. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.